everyone, and uh, welcome to the first thematic dialogue, Role of Media in the Building of Feminist Agenda. This dialogue is part of the activities of the Generation Equality Forum, and we are honored to have you with us. My name is Marion Reimers. I'm a sports journalist from Mexico, and I am delighted to be here in this wonderful company. The Generation Equality Forum is a global virtual gathering for gender equality convened by the U by UN Women and co-chaired by France and Mexico in partnership with civil society and youth constituencies from across the world. The forum will kick off in Mexico City in March 2021 and culminate in Paris in June 2021. Uh, as I mentioned before, I am delighted to be in present company, uh, beginning with Pascal Grotenhuis, Special Ambassador for Women's Rights and Gender Equality, Government of the Netherlands. So hello, Pascal, and it's so good to have you here with us. Next on, we have Mr. Kanbar Hossein Bor, Media Freedom Campaign Coordinator, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office for the UK. Thank you so much for being with us. Also, Sara Adwoa Safo, Gender Ministry of Ghana. Thank you so much for being with us. On the other hand, we have Thank also you. Sonia Santoro, Centro de Atención en Niñez, Adolescencia, Género y Diversidad de la Defensoría del Pueblo, which is the Center for Attention to uh, Childhood, Adolescence, Gender and Diversity, Defending the People, also a journalist from uh, the uh, diary or from the, I'm sorry, from the newspaper, Diario Página 12 from Argentina. Hello, Sonia, ¿cómo estás? Uh, Sainep Dahmul from the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. Hello. Uh, I believe there's also Edmund Yakani, or otherwise he hasn't arrived, but we'll still present him, Community Empowerment for Progress Organization in South Sudan. Also, Anita Gurumur uh, Gurumurti, yes, founding member and executive director Hi. for uh, IT for Change. Hello, Anita. Cindy Southward, Women's Safety Policy Manager for Facebook. And uh, last but not least, Nina Goswami, create, uh, Creative Diversity Leader and Journalist for the BBC. Hello. Well, since we've all been uh, introduced, I believe properly, if not, please uh, forgive my pronunciation in my English, but I'm delighted to be here, as I mentioned before. So we're going to begin uh, with this um, panel. And uh, first, I would like to talk to uh, Ms. Pascal. What do you think has been the progress made in the role of women in the media? And uh, what do you think are the setbacks and uh, challenges to be approached in the coming years? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I think looking back when I grew up, a lot of progress has been made. I think we only had male news uh, uh, readers and uh, thankfully, many things have changed and also the roles of women have changed. But there's still a lot of work to be done. I think gender inequalities are still perpetuated in and through the media, both in the Netherlands, but also in the countries that we work in uh, through our foreign policy and development cooperation. Um, many media mostly present a male-centric view of the world. Uh, gender bias and stereotyping uphold marginalization, discrimination, and violence against women and girls. And although there seems to be a positive shift uh, in the media, even though my daughter thinks it's way too slow in how women are portrayed, both in the Netherlands, we still have, if you look at expert panels, uh, we sometimes still have panels with only uh, male experts. <laughs> um, we had yesterday for the first time a female um, arbiter in a male uh, interland uh, on the football. And many of the commentators were just so sexist. Um, so we still have quite a lot of work to do. Um, and I think where the challenges are, um, I think it's the social media. We had a recent study in the Netherlands um, and it found that 10% of all tweets directed at female politicians contain hatred and aggression. And our minister, Sigrid Kaag, who's also the leader of a political party, she got 22% of uh, that. So every 15 minutes, she got a hatred tweet. Um, and I think for, in the Netherlands was for the first time that we had quite a few female uh, front runners in the elections, party leaders. And it was just incredible what they had to deal with. So I think that the biggest setback is that online misogyny is used as a political weapon. 
So it's 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 the combination of the social media and the hatred emails that I think is is really a setback we have to work on. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Pascal. Just a friendly reminder to everyone who's uh, with us. There is simultaneous interpretation in English, French and Spanish. So you will be all able to uh, listen in one of these uh, languages. Thank you so much to our interpreters as well, who are doing uh, all of this labor, but sometimes are not recognized. Uh, next up, Sonia Santoro, if you could also talk about this question in terms of what do we still have to tackle? What progress has been made in the role of of uh, women in media representation, because I agree with Pascal, as she, as she mentioned, and I would also like to add, it doesn't only have to do with the quantity, but with the quality of representation, I believe. Thank you, Sonia. Bueno, buena, buenos días. Encantada de estar con ustedes compartiendo las experiencias. Bueno, es decir, eh, Obviamente estamos, no estamos cerca hace 26 años, pero todavía falta mucho para alcanzar la igualdad. Eh, yo quería poner el acento en, en lo que ha pasado en los últimos cinco años, donde se ha acelerado eh, la participación de las mujeres, eh, impulsada por el movimiento de mujeres, por los feminismos, por los movimientos populares que estuvieron en Argentina, a partir del Ni Una Menos, en 2015, y en otros países, ¿no? con el Michu, distintas eh, movilizaciones populares feministas que instalaron eh, la gente feminista en la política y en los medios de comunicación, instalaron los temas, no solo la violencia de género, los abusos, sino la igualdad salarial, el aborto, etc., eh, también hubo mayor participación de mujeres en los espacios periodísticos. Algunas empresas han tomado eh, nota de esto y en Argentina, por ejemplo, han surgido muchos editores de medios que tienen un rol de supervisión de los contenidos, y eso es importante. Pero por supuesto, todo esto para destacar unos cambios y avances que son importantes, pero por supuesto son... Eh, insuficientes, eh, falta mucho todavía. Eh, creo que uno de los problemas que seguimos teniendo es el de la violencia hacia las mujeres periodistas, como mujeres somos, eh, sufrimos lo mismo que el resto de las mujeres, ¿no? eh, la violencia en línea, la acoso sexual, eh, muchas veces llevan a las mujeres a autocensuren o eh, que quieran abandonar la profesión. En el último informe, eh, hace poco aparecieron los datos del informe del Monitor Global de Medios, eh, datos pre preliminares, que dan cuenta de que todavía los medios no son espacios inclusivos para mujeres, y menos para las mujeres de, eh, históricamente discriminadas, como los grupos imaginados, eh, indígenas o las mujeres que escapan al modelo de belleza, al canon de belleza tradicional, eh, eh, las que superan la edad esperable por los medios de comunicación, porque el tema de la belleza, la edad es tremendo. Eh, ¿Y qué más decirles? Bueno, les traje, creo que esto es importante, otro de los temas es la, las condiciones laborales de las revistas periodísticas. La situación de las mujeres siempre es peor, eh, pero en general eh, los medios de prensa están muy precarizados y quise compartir un, unos datos de, de la Asamblea de Trabajadoras del diario donde yo trabajo, que me parece que dan cuenta no solo de, de lo que pasa en nuestro diario, que es un diario progresista y pionero, incluso tuvo el primer suplemento de género en el país, eh, hace muchos años, ya. pero las, las, las condiciones laborales son eh, muy malas. Por ejemplo, las mujeres componemos poco más del 30% de la planta que compone la base permanente del diario. Más de la mitad tenemos un vínculo precario con la empresa. Dos de tres trabajadoras no contamos con vacaciones licencias por maternidad, enfermedad, días de estudio pagas. 
de 130 trabajadoras, solo 21 ocupamos puestos de toma de decisión. Eh, y de las 85 trabajadoras que cumplimos tareas de reacción, solo 14 lo hacemos en relación de dependencia. Entonces me parece que esto no pasa, como les decía, solo en, en el diario donde trabajo, sino que se puede transportar a, a los medios, por lo menos de América Latina, donde a la crisis de los medios se le, eh, se le adiciona la situación particular que tenemos las mujeres y necesidades en estos entornos, ¿no? donde la, los tiempos, las estructuras, las rutinas están pensadas y siguen pensadas para los varones. Claro. Muchas gracias, eh, Sonia. Thank you, Sonia. And uh, next up, Cindy. Cindy Southward. What is your take on this? Thank you so much. For the past 27 years, I worked to end violence against women and empower women, there is quite an echo. Does everybody hear it? Don't know if the tech folks can mute anyone who's not speaking. I'm going to forge on. <laughs> okay, so uh, last July, I joined Facebook as their head of women's safety. But before that, I worked for 27 years in the NGO sector. So it is a delight to be on a panel with so many members of civil society. When I started a technology project 21 years ago, I wanted to harness technology to help women and also work to keep perpetrators from misusing technology to harm women. At Facebook, we understand that our platforms need to be a place where women and women journalists feel safe to communicate. To try without the headphones. Nope. So we take our role in abuse on Facebook very seriously. And that means doing whatever we can not to replicate the oppression, sexism, and barriers that exist in the real world. We want to try to keep that from being perpetuated on our platforms. And we know we have a lot more to do, which is why I was hired to harness all of our work for women's safety and try to move that initiative forward. I do want to point out a recent guide that I'll put in the Q&A. We released a journalist that has a lot of tips Things journalists can do to control your experience on the platforms, minimize comments, use profanity filters, use keyword filters to make sure that when you're amplifying a journalist voice, it is not being attacked. So I am um, pleased today and look forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, I uh, already sent a message to everybody helping us and they are going to start working on the fact of the echo. So I hope it, it, it goes away uh, soon. So next up, uh, Kanba Hossein Bohr. Uh, it's uh, nice to, to meet you, nice to say hello to you. On the other side of the table, what can governments do to tackle this? What can governments do to actually get into this conversation and not just give us um, empty promises? Well, firstly, uh, good morning, a good afternoon, a good evening to everyone. I hope you're all well. I'm hearing an echo as well. Um, I don't have a microphone, but I will pour John in the spirit of uh, Cindy. Um, I just wanted to say, first and foremost, a real pleasure to be invited to this really important panel. And I say this with a bit of pride. I'm proud to be the only man on this panel in the sense that it's already showing um, women and our female colleagues are empowered to occupy this public space and engage and hopefully I can also learn a lot from you. Um, very briefly about what governments can do, I'm approaching it from the perspective of our foreign ministry 
I'll be looking at it about withdrawing internationally to this issue. Um, I think it's worth bearing in mind, reminding ourselves what the problem is, and I've alluded to this already, but I was looking at the facts, and uh, it's, it's alarming to say that um, nearly three in four women uh, respondents generally have experienced online violence. That's, that's clearly unacceptable. We know that the mental health impacts of online violence are frequently identified by women, and some of them, 4%, uh, should get their jobs as of this. There's also the idea about representation of women as well. I'm conscious that it's a very complicated, multi class issue, but women of colour are also disproportionately affected by this. In particular, um, the point made earlier, 877 experts featured on primetime TV news recently, only 30% of the women, even smaller minority women of public colour. What we have learned through our evidence is that when women participate in public life, overall, the impact is positive, and not only society, but women benefit from that. Um, so, for example, when women are at the peace negotiating table, peace accords are 35 percent more likely to last 15 years or more than when they are not. That's a small but important factor. So, what are we trying to do about it? I'll just mention two factors, really. One is the UK is currently co-chair of the Media Freedom Coalition, an alliance of 47 countries coming together to promote media freedom and encouraging greater efforts to support journalists on the front line. This has included, for example, donations to the UNESCO Global Media Defence Fund, which have benefited over already 2,000 journalists, many of whom are women. We are also conducting a number of our overseas projects um, to support female journalists. Examples include in the Philippines, but I'm also I'm happy to say that the British Embassy in Mexico is part of UNESCO on a project to fund support for promote domestic journalism, which includes looking at how to support female journalists. I'll, I'll pause at that point in the spirit of time to allow some dialogue later. Thank you for bearing with me in the end. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Kambara Hossein Bor. Um, I am being told that mm, the echo can come from the interpretation. So if you turn back to floor, there's no echo. Like if you turn it off, apparently, uh, Cindy Kambar, you were having problems with this. Apparently, it should uh, be solved. Anyway, if it continues to be so, please let us know. Um, so moving on, uh, I would also talk to Anita Gurumurti. Anita, so nice to have you. And also what needs to be done by governments to guarantee gender equality in the media? It was so interesting what Kanbar was uh, also sharing with us. And I do believe that there needs to be obviously an intervention from governments, yet this is a very sensitive issue because we do not want freedom of speech to be impeded because of this. So how do we draw the line? Yeah, or where do we draw the line? That's, I think, as hard as a question can ever get, because where do we draw the line is about understanding a new public in the making, right? Uh, it's a seamless public, which extends from the online to the offline, offline to the online, back. And um, secondly, the experience of new media for users is very corporeal. I mean, it's about the body, it's about pre-existing social identities. The body never goes away. Your social identities don't go away. And therefore, thirdly, the structure of social power today uh, has continuities and discontinuities. The online space, the digital space is part of the social structure of discrimination, violence, as much as it is about the bastion of equality, voice and empowerment. I think the most important thing about government intervention, therefore, in respect of voice, in respect of equality, is to approach the new paradigm, uh, not through a lens of uh, patriarchal morality, fear, and discourses of danger, you know, all the time. We kind of uh, look, up, uh, look to um, uh, reports about how women feel intimidated or inhibited, but I think the narrative that we really need to frame through the policies out there is to really look at 
things that are empowering uh, so that women can embrace uh, a new paradigm of public participation. So it's all about uh, affirmative action on a different set of fronts, not just about media, but also about uh, encouraging the voices at the margins. You know, it might be a policy that seems unrelated, but the political economy of the platform economy is very important. Platform neutrality policies, gender access policies, content policies, etc. Now coming to a second dimension, uh, to make this domain safe and violence-free, we do certainly need laws, and we need laws that are about uh, looking at uh, gender-based violence afresh, because there are new forms of experiences, empirically speaking, stalking, doxing, deep fakes, NCII, and so many others. So you need to modify and appro uh, um, you know, approach your legal frameworks with a kind of graded uh, approach, you know, a fra framework that's a gradient, uh, not criminalizing everything, but allowing perhaps uh, standard setting by the government to flag and define content that may be uh, really uh, abusive, that may be violent. We also need the government to set standards for platforms so that the responsibility of platforms, the design uh, related imperatives can all be uh, articulated so that there's due process in the ways in which users and uh, platforms uh, interact. And what is patently illegal needs to be taken down through appropriate algorithmic application through human in the loop. So finally, we need that connection between virality and sexism to be broken if the public sphere has to be inclusive. And the government needs to put in place a new regulator who can also encourage educational activities, which is not just about digital literacy, but about uh, decoding the public sphere, so to speak. Thank you so much, Anita. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think that we also have to put uh, or to address the fact that sometimes access to technology and access to the internet is also, uh, there's also a disparity between girls and boys or men and women. So that obviously needs to be on the on the agenda. Uh, Saineb Dahmul, please let us uh, know your point of view on what needs to be done. Right now, we're talking about governments to guarantee gender equality in the media. We'll listen to you. Um, greetings, everyone. So my name is Zainab Dahmul. I am from Tunisia. And I, have, I represent the World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts. First, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of our movement of 10 million girls and women around the world. Um, first, I want to say that I agree with those who say, yes, we made a progress when it comes to, uh, um, to generation equality in media, because simply we made it. But is it enough? Of course, no. Around the world, uh, women are far less likely than men to be seen in the media. As subjects of stories, women only appear in a quarter of television, radio and print news, in employment as well. Most employees in the media, such as radio and TV, are male, with the females occupying a lesser percentage. The uh, job roles that women get in the media industry are most of the time junior and offering support. It is like rare to find women occupy leadership or senior positions, which most are occupied by their male counterparts, right? That's why we urge governments to create stronger mechanisms for girls and women to meaningfully participate in media spaces. Women must be equally uh, involved as men by showing women in leadership roles and as experts on a diversity of topics on a daily basis, not as an exception. Also, we urge governments to ensure that media include uh, news about and for women this is not just about covering women's issues, but it's about making sure content is balanced across gender lines and respect diversity. Also, we encourage governments to increase skills and leadership abilities through mentoring and development programs, ensuring that women have the confidence and skills they need to improve themselves. Mentoring and development programs are a way for more experienced professionals to boost the career of women whose like skills may not yet be fully realized. Uh, I'm going to talk about the 1995 building platform that flagged um, platform of action that flagged 12 key areas 
where urged action was needed to ensure greater e equality and opportunities for women and men, girls and boys. It is like critical for all of us, but did media cover it? No, because in 1995, media wasn't enough present. Urgent action must be taken and governments should emphasize on flagging it in the media. At that time in 1995, we didn't have smartphones and smart devices. In the policy document, social media part is not covered. Harassment that happened on digital spaces is not covered. We need to look at what revisions should be made on regional, national, and international levels. Across different types of media, women are still portrayed in traditional sexualized or auxiliary roles far more often than men. Men are disproportionately portrayed in the role of main executive agent. There should be a law to stop this and take media companies accountable on this. In general, media continue to present both women and men in stereotyped ways that limit our perceptions of human possibilities. In advertisement, for example, we see that, that women are in the kitchen, cooking or doing laundry. So they're changing young people's assumptions and stereotypes are built in their minds. Media should lead the way towards gender equality through gender sensitive and gender transformative content. For this, we need coherent policies, rules and mechanisms on all levels, starting with national media policies and media industry self-regulation. Usually, politicians and decision makers talk about issues concerning women. Decision makers and governments create opportunities for us, as girls and women, to share our experiences with you, listen to our recommendations, and collaborate with us. Yet, media does not cover all of that. And now we are seeing that it is normalizing violence against women, since we have seen that media positively portray aggression in males and, pass and, passivity, uh, and passivity in females. But we don't see how women react toward that. I mean, raising their voices and making a change. As I mentioned before, governments have to make sure that discussions are brought up to the public through the media. Media is, is responsible for, for what it is reporting. We must demand for policies that ensure that media is ethical and moral. I'm going to give the example of mentioning victims, for example, victims' names when it comes to sexual harassment or rape cases and that doesn't respect the ethical standards when, uh, uh, when mentioning victims' names. The World Association of Girl Guides and Girl Scouts believes that media plays a huge role in influencing the way people look at the world and make them change their views. Thus, we are working hard towards achieving gender equality through media, and we urge governments to work more on it, start implementing laws, not just having them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what a powerful message. And I absolutely agree. When we work in media, we tend to forget the impact that our stories have on the audience. And these are stories that have been told for centuries. And I think it is time to change our narrative. Just as Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie says, the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And that is what has been happening with women in media and with a lot of intersectionalities that I also think we need to take into account. How important it would be also to work with schools of journalism, to work with, uh, with newsrooms and also have the ability to um, convey a different message with those who actually have a voice in the, in the public arena. In that sense, I would like to start with you, Sarah Adwa Safo. Uh, what do you think is the role of the media in order to tackle all of these gender stereotypes? Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this forum. Um, I bring you greetings from Ghana. I think that um, a lot has been said by um, other speakers, which is that media is very important in the work that we do, looking at it from the perspective of um, a woman in leadership, a woman in politics, a woman in entrepreneurship. I think that the issue of stereotyping is a big challenge and a barrier for um, gender equality. Looking at um, where I'm coming from in Africa, there's a lot of stereotyping with um, young girls and boys growing up. And I think the media can play a very important role 
to erase that um, erroneous stereotyping, to position women and girls in a position where they can be leaders, they can be entrepreneurs, they can be whatever they want to be and break the glass ceiling. I think that government also has a lot to do from that perspective if we should continue to have books that have paintings or pictures of young girls only in the kitchen helping their mothers while the boys play football or the boys are made to look masculine and in charge of everything all the time, I think that it doesn't help. So the media is very important, all forms of media, whether print, media, social media, it's a way of giving information, it's a way of educating, it's a way of getting people aware of things that otherwise they are not aware of. So it's a very important tool to set the right agenda to empower women. And I must say that um, in Africa, um, the ECOWAS, for instance, in the ECOWAS sub-region, I must say we've been able to do a lot to put, um, portray women entrepreneurs, women in business through the African Women Digital Platform. And I think that, um, we can learn from that, not only showcasing women in entrepreneurship, but women everywhere with the tool of the media. I think that with social media, the negativity that goes with it, it makes people shy away from it. But I must say that it's a very, very important tool as well. Being a politician, a woman, you know, the attacks that come on you through social media because there's very little restriction and all that. I think um, we need to set an agenda with the media again, using female journalists to educate those of us who are shying away from social media, especially to veer into it because it has its positives as well. The youth are there. That is how they contact you. They're, we're moving into a paperless um, world where it's uh, ICT, it is technology, it's digitalization. So uh, we shouldn't let the um, stereotyping that goes with the attacks on social media and everything, let us shy away from it. I agree with an earlier speaker who stated that indeed we need to strengthen our legal framework. I, um, we have the laws. I mean, speaking from um, an African perspective, the issue is not having legislation. The issue is implementation of these um, 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 legal framework or legislation. I am a lawyer myself. I can speak of a number of um, um, laws that we have in Ghana that protects the right to um, speech, which is freedom of uh, expression. It is in our constitution across the countries in Africa. Every country has a constitution that safeguards the right to speak or the right to speech. So that is not the issue. The issue is how do we make these laws reflective in our everyday work by not stereotyping women, by not letting our, our cultures, our differences, our, our, our background, put people more, especially women and girls in a position where they're seen as a weaker sex. So I think that um, journalists, more especially women journalists can do a lot to help in this agenda. We need the he for she as well. We need the men to also add up their voices to it. But I think that um, the saying usually goes that women are their own enemies. We have to break that myth, that mystery. So if we can, rally around all women journalists to make them understand that we need to position the girl child, position women, make the right stories about women, not negative stories that discourage other women from entering into leadership positions or decision-making processes. I think it's gonna help a lot. Um, again, I, I have to say that we need also to encourage these women and protect them. I mean, journalists be it um, social media, print, or other forms of uh, media, television hosts and all that. When yeah. they're putting right issues, they can be a target for attacks, which an earlier speaker spoke about. So I think that 
um, if they, they, they have the needed protection from the states, the needed protection from the legal steps or legal procedures that has been put in place, they will be in the right position, not thinking about somebody harming them directly or indirectly, any member of their families in setting the right agenda of um, gender equality and removing all forms of stereotyping so that women can actually reach their heights in, in whatever sphere that it finds themselves in. I thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would also like to remind our speakers, please not to turn off their cameras, even though if you're not speaking, because we all want to see your reactions. We all want to have you here with us. So uh, please leave your cameras turned on. Um, yes, what Sarah mentions is uh, very, very important as a victim myself from, from uh, trolling, bullying, threats, etc. I think it is important that we enable mechanisms for other women not to be discouraged in uh, entering the public arena and entering public, the, the public speech arena, because that is what has been the historic mechanism for silencing us. We have been self-silenced also because we're afraid. So I think that that is a big issue and we need to tackle. Um, I'm sorry, we need to tackle this right away. So uh, next up, I would like uh, also to have Nina Goswami talk about this. What can media do, Nina? Please go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, just to remind you, I'm uh, Nina Goswami, I'm the Creative Diversity Lead uh, for the BBC, but I'm also um, on the Gender Steering Panel for the European Broadcasting Union. Um, so I'm going to take this from a, a slightly European perspective, um, as well as UK and uh, British perspective. Um, we have been thinking a lot about this, obviously, over the last few years. Um, and from um, the EBU perspective, we came up with a particular roadmap called All Things Being Equal, which gave us um, four key pillars that we've been adopting as public service broadcasters um, across Europe and the UK. Um, so there's four points to this. Assess the situation using data, engaging everyone. So that's men, women, everyone articulating and introducing policies that enable gender equity to take place and also for focusing on culture. So looking at those four pillars, these also subsume into something that we um, started at, in the BBC, in the heart of the BBC London newsroom, and that was the 5050 Equality Project, uh, which I lead, um, but was started by a presenter called uh, Ros Atkins from Outside Source. Um, what we do um, in the Equality Project is we look at content, we look at what is happening on TV, radio and online, and we try and increase representation of women um, to 50%, so 50-50. Um, and the BBC are not alone in doing that. We have 85 organisations across 26 countries um, also taking part in using 50-50 and um, across 15 um, of the public sector broadcasters in Europe as well. So what are we doing? We're doing something very simple. We're doing what we call as our mantra, count, share, change. We are counting and we're assessing what our content looks like. We're counting the number of men and number of women to increase our represent representation of women to 50% women over a set period of time. We're doing that for what we can control. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But what we're doing with that data, real-time data, is we're an analyzing it and we're working out what are we doing? Why are we today on our daily program hitting 70% men, 30% women? What can we change? How can we adapt that so that we can reach that 50% women in a month's time? Because that's the kind of target that we're setting for a daily program. When we analyze that, then we share it with the rest of the teams. We are trying to innovate with each other. We're trying to give each other permission to create change, to go out, find new voices, to widen the pool of the talent that is being put on our content, to improve the experts, to try and remove those manuals, as Pascal was talking about earlier. Um, and we, we can only do that together if we're sharing that data in real time together. And then obviously we're trying to create that change. Because at the end of the day, as many of you have said, there's only so far you can go with understanding what the problem is and having a strategy. You need to actually implement and you actually need to create the change. And so that's what 5050 does. We identify through the data what's happening. We then work out 
together how we collaborate and create the change and then we go and make that change and that's what we're doing at uh, the bbc two-thirds of our teams this time last year as the world was going into lockdown reached 50 percent women representation in the month of march which is an increase of a third from when they first started on the project and as i say we're now doing that in 26 countries across the board so for me, there are real solutions that the media are already putting forward. Um, and through this discussion, one of the things that I, I kind of keep touching on in my head is that 20, 25 years ago, we were the content makers, we, the media, the traditional TV, radio, online. But now everyone can be a content maker. And so there is a bigger responsibility on us all to be trying to strive for gender equality. And I think about that not only from a media perspective, not only from a social media, Facebook perspective, but also from the likes of the fact that governments and state players are perhaps the biggest volume content uh, producers that are out there at the moment. So they could be leading by example and trying to ensure that what they're putting out on their websites, on their social media, on their advertising is also 50-50 and help with that gender equality. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Nina. Uh, moving up to Edmund Yakani, uh, since we're also rounding up our participation in order to have questions from the audience. So uh, let's uh, try and listen to your answer, Edmund, and then I'm going to have one final question so we can uh, um, listen to what the audience also has to ask you guys. Um, thank you very much and hi to everyone. Uh, my name is Edmund Yakani from South Sudan, and I'd like to speak in terms of what role can media play in building feminist agenda and specifically in, con in conflict set context? I would like to first to confirm all what my colleagues have spoke before. I don't repeat it because for the sake of time, but I think it's a right time now. We need to start questioning who said the narratives in the media. If you want to put a feminist media. So I think setting the narrative in the media is very important. And I, and, and, and I, do, and I do agree and I do accept my colleagues who say it yeah, once in the past, the media is really male dominant and there's a lot of stereotypes against women. I'll give you an example, for example, in a context like Africa, where I'm speaking from, South Sudan, where it's a conflict prong state, you come to realize that you only see images of female politicians once they have done something bad. One that's done something good, you can't see the images in the forefront of the media. And I think that depends on who are the editors and why the editors are doing that and to what level are we informing the editors in terms of really setting an agenda which is um, feminist. So for me, what really, if you want to set an, we want to play with the media to set a feminist role or to play, to set a feminist agenda, the best, most important is that the women who are in the media sector, what role are they playing? What level of leadership are they given? What level of decision have they given? And I think even if you can build a medium owned women owned media houses that can take lead in that in order to complement the gap that is existing. Because one of the biggest thing I can see in my country, like what um, uh, my, the last speaker spoke from BBC is that if you look at the media and look, look at angle of 50-50, where is the chance given to the male, where is the chance given to the female, you come to realize that the media, the traditional media that exists in South Sudan is really a male dominant media. And I think in most of African countries, media is a male, dominant because men have the money, they can own media houses and they can set the narrative in media houses, they can decide. At the same time, so most of the editors are male and, 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 and they couldn't play a big role in setting a feminist agenda in the media. So I think media play. One thing I'd like to bring is that also the male journalists approach my own fellow male journalists in the media has to understand why we need to give equal opportunities and why we need to set a feminist agenda in the media because that is a part of society. That's a part of sex and society. We don't believe it out. We can't really say the media have to be all male dominant and want to leave out the voice of the women. So for me, in terms of my experience in context of South Sudan as a human rights activist, I'm also like, I add my voice to my sister who I've spoke from Ghana. I'm a lawyer by profession. There's a lot of incidents I can talk about, but I don't repeat for the sake of time. But I think it's a right time now that even the social media, we need to see um, women taking lead, coming out and putting it up. Like I, I've been looking at, 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 our, at our politicians in East African region, which is covering South Sudan, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania. I'm trying to see how many female politicians are so active in Twitter. What are they tweeting? For example, ministers, are they tweeting about their work? Are they sharing in Facebook about that? There's a bit of a little 
um, performance eh, from female who are really ministers, who are leaders, who are tweeting, who are engaged in social media. So I think I do agree with some of the speakers who spoke before that this is the right time we need to get female journalists to speak to those female leaders who are sort of like really moving away from media, are shy in using the media because if one media to set a feminist agenda, then we need to see the few female who are available, they play an instrumental role in the available media outlets. I don't take a lot, but I, as I said, I agree with the uh, previous speakers who have spoke before me. I actually share the same um, concerns that they have. I said the same uh, recommendation that they have. For the sake of um, time, I wish to respond to questions that may be thrown to us as a speakers, but, but I, I really I'm speaking from context of where it's, it's a really conflict setting and start asking what role can media play in setting feminist agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Edmund. There seems to be a bit of a problem with your connection, but I think everything came across just fine. And I actually uh, couldn't agree more. We also need a lot of um, allies and we also need to uh, have men take a deep look inside and understand their deep connection towards this problem because this is not a problem women created and it seems that we magically have to fix it and we don't even get the tools to do so or the power to do so so actually i think that that is a very important perspective uh rounding up please uh let's uh try and keep this short so we can also listen to questions from the audience cindy i'm gonna go back to you what would be your recommendations to comply with what was established in the beijing platform and in the gef and with the Action Coalition on Technology and Innovation. Thank you so much. Uh, in terms of really working to create a world where we have true gender equality, one of the things that we are, I'm very proud that we do is we partner with civil society. And so we work with over 400 uh, organizations around the globe. Almost half of them are women's safety organizations, Anita's, for example, and Committee uh, to Protect Journalists, like sort of broad-based uh, safety organizations. Some are specific. But we really need to create a world where it would never occur to someone to attack any journalist, especially a female journalist. And until then, and while we're working to do that major social change work that Nina mentioned, we need to also be providing tools and resources and protections to women and women journalists while we're working on that pretty phenomenal social change effort. So for example, if, um, Somebody uh, post the question, I'm happy to answer it and provide a few links, but we've got a, a journalist guide, safety tips with all sorts of ways to control your experience. Some of my women journalist friends actually prefer to post their stories on Facebook and Instagram because they have more content control over the comments than they do if it's on their main media website, uh, mainstream media page, where they don't have any control, a profanity filter, or any way to keep the discourse um, sort of civil and yet still being engaging with their readers. Um, one of the other things that we're doing is we have a journalist registration program now in almost 40 countries and we add extra protections for journalists because we know they're targeted. And so we want to keep their account secure, we want to keep their um, their ability to stay online uh, protected. And so I'll also post a link to the journalist registration uh, resources. But essentially the, the, the big message I want to share is that for gender equality, we have to work together with government, civil society, and the private sector so that we can envision and realize this world free of violence. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would also like to know what Anita has to say about this. Sorry, I just took a second to unmute. Um, yes, I think as previous speaker just mentioned the most important thing we're not talking about just a digital divide. We're talking about a divide in narrative power. So in the post-truth world, so to speak, whose story counts? So um, the Secretary General, UN Secretary General's uh, report on digital cooperation has brought to center stage the human rights implications of data and AI. And I think that uh, a lot of things need to change in the, human, in the ways in which we frame the human rights discourse perhaps in the next 100 years in the digital age, right? So we need a new mandate for the, com the CEDAW committee, for the special rapporteurs, for instance, the UN special rapporteur on minority rights just now is uh, uh, you know, putting together a very important document on uh, sexism and sexist hate speech against uh, minorities. So similarly, these agenda within the UN systems really have to improve. The second, I think, is a very important 
um, and non-negotiable uh, benchmarking on accountability standards for artificial intelligence. And um, I think that we do need uh, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to really nudge the private sector on AI for news feeds, avoiding gender biases in targeting, racial profiling, to simply cut out co uh, content that is polarizing. And we welcome uh, the recent human rights policy of Facebook, and we need all platforms to uh, really look at uh, such a thing. But the benchmarking of human rights really is not a privatized activity. We need to understand that there's only so far that private consulting firms will do in uh, trying to audit uh, algorithms of uh, the private sector. We do need global benchmarks that are endorsed by states and we need national governments to really make sure that the kind of polarization and hate we see um, uh, because of an algorithmified public sphere is really checked. And there, I think, calling to attention the fact that there is a contradiction between the engagement rates that the private sector seeks through click baiting and the ways by which you know social media can become a space through you know compassionate empathetic and critical thinking based uh, democracies you know this contradiction has to be essentially bridged if we want to really see a feminist future thank you thank you anita kanbar what is your your take on this and after this we will proceed to questions from the audience well, well thank you very much um for me i'm as someone who is trying to help develop an international response to this issue. I find the discussion really, for me, fascinating, but also a reminder of the extent of the challenge that we have, because without stating the obvious, what we're seeing here in this context of media freedom and women is a reflection of wider societal issues. And that media and women is not going to operate in a vacuum. So, so long as we do have the injustices that people have described, namely women continuously uh, suffering despite the progress. But unfortunately, we're going to still see women in media also a reflection of this particular problem. What we do about it at the, at the micro level, these discussions are really important because we can't do enough to restate the problem. I think it's very easy for us to lose sight of the problem because in many contexts, there's all people almost seem to think that there's a lot of progress and the problem will go away. So these sessions are really helpful to restate that the problem persists. At the, at the macro level, what I can say is that the Media Freedom Coalition, we will be having a, a, another major conference hosted at the end of this year. And I will speak to my colleagues in the executive group um, of eight other countries to see what steps we can be taking as a coalition to shine a light on these issues through the various platforms that we have. So that's one thing I take away uh, from this particular context and a commitment to all of you that we will raise this issue and see what more we can be doing. But I'm really grateful for all the valuable insights, especially the cross-sectional insights that we've had, uh, in particular the points about women in different contexts, different backgrounds and, and different countries. Thank you very much, over. Thank you uh, so much. So I'm going to uh, start with uh, this question, and I would like uh, first uh, Pascal and also uh, Sarah to answer this. Um, are there any global programs on the agenda to facilitate access to uncensored internet, which I also believe is a big issue that we have to have on the table? I mean, I can see by your face, Pascal, that um, this is also a very difficult question and a surprising one, but is there anything you can tell us about it? And after that, I would like to listen from Sarah Adwoa, please. Sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Are there global programs for uncensored? Are there any programs on the agenda to facilitate access to uncensored internet? Because I believe this is a, a very big concern for the audience because not in every country do we have um, uncensored access to the internet. So I do believe that also countries that have this access should be yeah. able to work with the other countries to, to assure this. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, actually. I've been, I've been posted as an ambassador in, in Africa and um, it's, it's not all open and transparent news, of course. Um, we have quite some programs working with uh, uh, civil society uh, on journalism and openness and uh, transparent news. 
Um, I'm not aware of a global program that we are supporting, I have to say, but we have uh, many programs on uh, safe space, uh, safe internet space, and in, in training journalists, both male and female journalists. Um, but I can promise you to, to dig a little bit further, but not, we don't have a Dutch funded program, but I'm sure that they are global programs. So if anyone knows, please answer. But uh, maybe Sarah Edmund knows something about this by his reaction. I could tell that he might be on to something. So <laughs> I think I'll follow suit from the earlier speaker. Um, I, I think that um, we'll, it's an area that you've mentioned that's important that I, I will personally avert my mind to it. But speaking right now, um, I think I would have to do some more um, research on that. And I think that um, it's good you brought it up from our perspective here from Africa. I think we would have to look at it again. Thank you. Okay. So uh, moving on, I would also like uh, Sonia to answer on, on, on this question and maybe Nina. Um, from your experience as communicators, how is motherhood portrayed for women with a successful career? I think that this is a, a basic question. And from someone who comes from sports, it has been so interesting to see how motherhood is portrayed, for example, in sports media, but I think in media in general. So uh, Sonia, if you could uh, begin, I'd really appreciate that. Thank you. Hola. Eh, bueno, mira, justo escribí un libro sobre la maternidad. Eh, la maternidad, la verdad que a las mujeres nos, nos desafía de manera muy fuerte porque todavía nuestra sociedad tiene, tiene una mirada muy paradojal y contradictoria de la maternidad. Por un lado, eh, se, la, se la alaba se la ensalza, digamos, se la valora mucho, pero al mismo tiempo no se le da las condiciones a las mujeres para que puedan llevar eh, adelante una maternidad sin estar sobrecargadas de trabajo, porque no hay las licencias suficientes, porque en los espacios laborales no hay condiciones para que o puedan seguir con la lactancia, o si deciden otra cosa, realmente puedan tener una crianza eh, compartida, porque... Eh, todavía el tema del reparto de, de los cuidados en, a, hacia adentro del hogar están eh, muy mal repartidos y sobrecargan a las mujeres y porque el Estado no lo, no lo ve todavía como un problema eh, a resolver, porque todavía las políticas que hay en este sentido son parches, son pocas, no llegan a todas las mujeres, eh, y creo que la pandemia justamente puso, eh, le dio visibilidad a este tema, ¿no? al tema de, de los cuidados y la necesidad de que eh, eh, como, como países y como estados eh, y a nivel global veamos todo el aporte que estamos haciendo las mujeres sosteniendo las crianzas, los cuidados eh, de hijos y también de personas mayores. ¿no? Entonces esto claramente... Eh, muchas veces es un obstáculo para poder insertarse eh, laboralmente con empleos a jornada completa, con empleos con, con seguridad social, para poder pelear ascensos, para poder pelear por esa paridad que, que sí las peleamos en, en, en muchos espacios, pero es difícil de sostener. Eh, entonces, eh, me parece que el mundo tiene que empezar a, a ver eh, la maternidad de otra manera, incorporar, eh, eh, incorporarla al ciclo de la vida y que el trabajo también eh, sea parte de ese ciclo de la vida, ¿no? que cuidemos, nos cuidemos eh, no solo eh, las mujeres, sino todo, toda la sociedad y los estados que tengan una perspectiva distinta y hoy además esto también se, se cruza con el tema del medio ambiente, también tenemos que ser Cuidados, cuidadosos y cuidadosas del medio ambiente. Creo que, el, que justamente la pandemia llamó la atención sobre estas dos cuestiones de manera muy, muy fuerte. Eh, eso es lo que se me ocurre decir. 
Gracias, eh, Sonia. I believe that some of you were not able to listen to the English interpretation, so I'm going to just make a very uh, synthetic uh, English um, translation from what Sonia said. I hope it is correct, Sonia. Uh, but Sonia has written a book about this. She says that there is a dichotomy in the speech in terms of how we treat motherhood. On the one hand, we um, put it on a pedestal. On the one hand, we talk about women being able to bring life. Uh, to the world, but on the other hand, we are not enforcing mechanisms that allow women to be in the professional sphere as they would like to. It um, uh, doesn't grant them access to uh, different um, uh, different capacities in terms of uh, maternity leave that is paid for, uh, rights for for women who are who are working and have children. So it actually becomes an impediment in terms of professional development for many women. So we actually, as a society, have to understand how the pandemic also has put into perspective the um, the caregiving that women are. Um, that is brought upon them and this big responsibility and that it is important for also men to understand that caregiving should be their task, that they should be part of this. And this also has to do also with the perspective uh, in terms of protecting the environment. So everything is just um, kind of cr crossing into one lane and uh, structures need to be changed in, 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 in that sense. Um, Sonia, thank you so much. I am so sorry for my, for my interpretation. I hope it kind of came across. And Nina, I would like to listen to you on this subject. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for, uh, for the summary, <laughs> because I was one of those who um, <laughs> had a problem with the English translation. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, to pick up on some of Sonia's points, I think uh, when it comes to portrayal of, of motherhood, gender-based um, kind of employment rules are, are, are quite impactful um, in terms of um, how things are, are framed. And I think actually one of the things that we've seen through actually seeing that increase of women's representation on the BBC is that we're finding that motherhood is portrayed in different ways. We're hearing about it from different aspects. And that's the importance of giving women voice at the end of the day. Because the more that we give women voice, the more they have the opportunity of telling their stories. I'll give you an example of um, what happened for the Vietnamese service. And I think um, at the BBC, which was a really interesting thing. Um, when they joined uh, 5050 and looked at increasing women's representation, they never thought they would eat, reach 50% uh, women contributors. Within about four months, they were 80%, 80%. And I asked them why, you know, what happened? How have you moved from, from not thinking you'll even get to 50%? It's because they started speaking to women. They started asking them about their stories and the result was that they had a wealth of stories that, and different perspectives on parenthood, on other stories that they didn't know about, that they had never seen before. And so they were then using those stories on their content and that changed the dynamics for them. It also changed the perception the audience had of their particular product with their audiences, even looking at um, seeing whether they could come and work at the BBC as a result of that increase. Because if you're improving that representation on screen, there has to be a reason for it. Um, and so that's the power of, of role modeling, whichever direction it's in, whether it's motherhood or if it's in a different direction, because by bringing awareness, raising the education around these particular areas, we're giving people different perspectives on different people's lives in different scenarios. And I think that's really, really powerful. And you can only get that by having true equality when it comes to voice, when it comes to gender. Thank you so much, uh, Nina. Now I have a question for uh, Sainib Dahmul. It says, how will rights of a female journalist be safeguarded, especially in an Islamic cultural context? I don't know if you could speak to this. Can you just repeat the question, uh, the first part? Absolutely. How will rights of a female journalist be safeguarded, especially in an Islamic cultural context? Um, yes, so yeah, I'm Muslim and there's like, uh, some ideas or that are really wrong that are really spread in the whole world that like women in for example Islam are now for example allowed to practice uh, journalism or to be journalists but I want to say that it is really really the same for the whole world and we are 
like here um if we want like i am I, you see i am a woman i am a young girl and i am really practicing my rights of like uh, of speaking of uh, uh of taking part in discussions and all but Unfortunately, and I say, I, unfortunately, there are people who are really sp spreading these um, informations because uh, women like in all cultures, as well as Islam, are safe. And if they want to practice any kind of activity, they are free to do it. So uh, we cannot just uh, make Islam as a, an exception uh, or something like this, because all women in this world are, are equal and there is no like um, like specific rules for um, Muslim um, women, for example. Thank you. I absolutely agree. Clap on that. Um, Edmund uh, Jakani, we have an interesting question here. Is there any kind of manual or normativity in any of your countries that regulates feminist approach for media, as well as a proper capacitation for journalists and media CEOs? In, 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 if I speak to my country, I would say yes. We have manual, and we have been working this together with UNESCO. We have been doing together with some assistance from UN Women, and we have a guidance. And that's what. And this this is what empowers me to start checking the media. How much is the media really giving a space for feminist voices for setting a feminist agenda? So it's there. The only thing is not becoming the capacity. When it comes to the capacity, still there are cultural practices. That like what my sister have said about the Islam, which for me student views an excuse, steal their voices, denying young girls joining the field of journalism and becoming as agencies that bring out the voices of the communities. Because if you're a female journalist, it does not only bring out the voice of women, she bring out the voice of the society for the attention of the society. So for me, the manual is there and we're doing our level best to work with CEOs of companies, with owners of, com of media companies, and even train editors in chief of papers in terms of language you even sometimes realize that as how much we know to put a feminist uh, sort of like agenda in the media but still language play a big role in the way how we use language that sometimes demonstrate negative attitudes or negative stereotypes in behind the curtains towards females so i would like to say yes thank you so much uh, edmund i I mean, we have so many questions that are unfortunately going to be unanswered, but some of you have also been answering uh, the questions from the audience through the private chat, which I really appreciate, or well, at least the, the, the chat that we have here. Um, I mean, we thank all of the speakers for the valuable participations, and I think that it should be highlighted that this is not a local pro pro problem. This is a global problem. It has intersectionalities. We need to take into account all of the different perspectives from so many women around the world, from so many cultures, from so uh, um, many perspectives, but still, this is a global prob problem, and we also need men to tackle this. This is not a problem we created. This is not a problem that we are going to solve ourselves. And if you want us to do that, at least give us the power positions to do so. But since that is not happening either, well, we should all be on one front together. It has been an absolute delight for me to be here. I very much appreciate all of your uh, insights, all of your perspectives. Thank you so much. And to everybody uh, who has been here, Thank you, because these are times in which sometimes we're not open to listening and to have you listen to us for an hour and a half has been absolutely honorable. It is a, a pleasure. And thank you all so much. Greetings from Mexico. And hopefully we can do this in person some other day. Big hug. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Bye bye. Stay safe. Thank you, guys. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.